Hello, I am Dr. Ravina from Zonas and NHS Women's Health Doctor, and I'd like to welcome you to the dedicated channel for women's health. So today I'd like to cover a really important topic that quite a few of you have a private messaged me to ask me to cover this topic. And I know so many of you suffer from this and would like help with it. So today we'll be covering polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay, so before we begin, um, I'm all dressed up and the reason why I am is because I'm finally out of isolation and I am celebrating. So I'm going out for a brunch today. So I thought why not fit in a few videos for you and um, just talk about this really important topic. So what I'd like to do is just break this up into a few videos. So in this video, we'll be talking about what polycystic ovaries ovarian syndrome is, how to diagnose it, what symptoms you'll have, and then also some investigations that you might also need to have. And then in the next video, we'll talk about treatments. So um, stay tuned for that video as well. And then I think we'll probably do another video uh, looking at the long-term complications of polycystic ovaries and how you can deal with that throughout your life. So let's begin. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. So quite a long word, quite a long phrase. And let me just break it down for you. Now, sometimes in medicine, things get given a name. So some conditions, diseases get given a name and the name isn't actually that accurate of what the condition is. So this is an example of that. Polycystic ovaries suggests you have poly, which means many, cysts, which are, you know what cysts are, cysts on the ovaries. And actually in polycystic ovarian syndrome, you don't actually have cysts on the ovaries. They look like cysts and sometimes they may behave like, behave like cysts, but they're not. What they are, are developing follicles. So it looks like you've got lots of little blobs on the ovaries when you look at it under an ultrasound, but these are just lots of developing follicles that are trying to develop into an egg to be released. So that's the first thing. You don't have lots of cysts on your ovaries if you have this. Polycystic ovaries is really common. So the statistic, I think, I've got it written down, is about five to 20% of premenopausal women will have polycystic ovaries. So in real terms, that's like one in five people, but it can be up to one in 20. And we know that many people have polycystic ovaries, ovarian syndrome, but don't have the diagnosis. So that's why there's a little bit of a range there. So if you think about that, that's a lot of women in the population that are suffering from this condition. And unfortunately, it's not something that we can just magically treat. It's something we need to manage over time. It's something that if you have it now, you'll most likely have it throughout the rest of your life. And it's about how we manage it in terms of the symptoms and in terms of the long-term complications. So let's cover some of the symptoms that you might experience with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And the reason why I'm stressing syndrome is because you can have polycystic ovaries, but it doesn't mean you have the syndrome. So PCO, polycystic ovaries, is different to polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. So they're two different things. Some of the symptoms you might have, which you might already know about, so things like excessive hair growth, so you may get this uh, typically around your nose, uh, so um, a moustache on your chin, around your face. Um, some women may, may also get this on their chest. You may get it around your breasts and on your back. Um, and this is really common and it's sometimes really embarrassing to talk about. And I find that some of my patients will only say they have it unless I ask specifically, do you have hair on your nipples, on your back? And yes, it is quite embarrassing, but as I said, this is really common. So more women than you think will suffer from this. And that is because polycystic ovarian syndrome um, has results in more testosterone floating around your body. So that's the first thing. And medically that's called hirsutism. So hirsutism is excessive hair growth and typically in a male pattern distribution. So where men generally get hair is where women will. So face, chest, back. Another symptom that you might notice is having more acne. And this can also not only just be on the face, but also be on the chest and on the back and perhaps even on the upper arms. So you may get acne as well as excessive hair growth. You may also notice that you are a bit bigger in size and it's perhaps easier for you to put on weight than it is for other people. 
And so not only is it easier for you to put on weight, but also it's really hard to get rid of the weight. So you might be exercising loads and notice actually I'm exercising perhaps more than other people, but I just can't get rid of the weight. And this is a really hard thing for many women. And it doesn't mean that you're not doing it right. If you're exercising, excellent. You need to carry on doing that. And it can be really frustrating when you're not seeing any shift in weight. And it's very typical of polycystic, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And in fact, about 40% of, of patients will be obese. The next symptom that you might suffer from is irregular periods. And this is one of the most common things. So not only would you have irregular periods, which is called oligomenorrhea. So that actually means um, fewer periods. You may also have no periods. Some women may not actually have a period at all. You'll have a time where perhaps it's six months, maybe it's 12 months where you don't have a period and that's called amenorrhea. So that's without any periods. And the reason why, we, why this happens is because you're not ovulating regularly. So therefore you're not producing a bleed. And we can go into a little bit about the blood test that your blood test may show if you have polycystic, polycystic ovarian syndrome. In terms of some of the long-term consequences of having polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, one of them is uh, reduced fertility. So if you do have it, you may notice that it might take you a bit longer to get pregnant. Um, and we will cover this in a little bit more detail in the long-term consequences of polycystic ovarian syndrome video, which will be in this series. And um, you may also notice skin changes. So in polycystic ovarian syndrome, you are at increased risk of getting diabetes. And the reason for that is because there's an element of resistance to insulin. And insulin is the key factor that drives whether one has diabetes or not, because our body needs sensitivity to it. If we lose that sensitivity and then become resistant to it, which is very common in PCOS, then that increases our risk of getting it. If not when you're younger, then it'll most likely happen um, when you're older. It might not happen, but you're just at increased risk of it happening. And that can manifest as skin changes. So there's something called, um, the medical word is acanthosis nigrocans. And I'll put a little picture here, it looks like this. And um, it's like a rash, and uh, it looks like a rash. It's like hyperpigmentation within the underarms. And that's a manifestation of insulin resistance. So um, you have a higher risk of having type two diabetes if you notice this. And if you do have this, please go to speak to your doctor because um, they'll do some blood tests for you. So moving on to blood tests, moving on to how do we know whether we have polycystic ovarian syndrome? Well, there is a criteria. It's called the Rotherham criteria. And you need two out of three things. So the three things are one, you need to have irregular periods or no periods. That's number one. Number two is having um, signs of high testosterone. So this can either be biochemical signs, therefore things in your, just doing a blood test and then noticing you have high testosterone or clinically you have signs of high testosterone. So lots of body hair, hirsutism, acne, um, increased body odor or sweating. Um, they're all signs of high testosterone, also known as hyperandrogenism, which means you have a high androgen level in your blood. And the third thing is having polycystic, polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. So you'll go for an ultrasound of your pelvis and that'll either be externally or internally. You can choose, but um, it's more sensitive inside the vagina and doing the scan. And we can have a closer look at the ovaries to see if you have 12 or more follicles. If you have 12 or more follicles on one or both ovaries, then you are likely to have polycystic ovaries. So those are the three criteria, but you only need two out of three to have the diagnosis of PCOS. It's really important to note that if you were to have a scan, and, to ha and were found to have cysts on your ovaries, so that's more than 12 follicles, if you don't have the other two criteria, it doesn't mean you have PCOS because you need to have two out of three. And similarly, you can have PCOS without having any cysts on your ovaries, which I think is really interesting. So you can actually have nothing. Your ovaries can look completely normal, but if you have elevated testosterone and irregular periods, you can still have the diagnosis. 
Okay, so that covers um, that covers the criteria. So let's now talk about what to expect when you go to your doctor. So perhaps you think you might have polycystic ovarian syndrome and you're wondering what what they might do. Well, this is what they're going to do. They're going to do one, a blood test, and two, they're going to do a scan of your pelvic organs to look at your ovaries. So in the blood test, what you're likely to see if you do have PCOS is one, you're going to have high level of circulating testosterone. Testosterone is a male hormone, but women also produce it just to a lesser extent. But in women with PCOS, you will have a higher range, a higher value of testosterone, which will be greater than the normal range. And that is what is contributing to your symptoms of acne, hirsutism, um, can also increase your risk of obesity as well. So with a low sex hormone binding globulin, the reason why that's low is because you may just be born with less of this protein. And it's a protein that circulates around your blood and its whole purpose is to capture the testosterone. So it's sex binding, so it binds to the testosterone because that's the sex hormone. It basically binds it to a protein to make it inactive. So even if you have lots of testosterone in the blood, but you have high sex hormone binding globulin, then the testosterone will be bound to the sex hormone binding globulin and become inactive. But if you have high testosterone, but low sex hormone binding globulin, then the high testosterone isn't going to be bound to the sex hormone binding globulin because you don't have very much of it. Therefore, you're gonna have more active component of testosterone circulating around the blood. And that is what gives you the manifestations of lots of testosterone. I hope that makes sense. Um, if not, please just write in the comments so I can clarify it for you. Another thing in your blood to look for is luteinizing hormone, also known as LH. And you can watch my video on hormones explained to learn a little bit about this hormone. Simply, LH will stimulate your ovary to release an egg. If you have lots of LH, which is what you do have in PCOS, your, your brain is telling your ovaries, okay, you haven't had a period in a long time, I need to keep stimulating you so that you can release an egg and have a menstrual cycle so you will have a period. But the ovaries aren't really listening to the brain. And so the brain is like, well, you're not listening to me, so I'm gonna keep secreting LH. So LH is produced in the brain and it goes to your, your ovaries and your brain is saying, actually, you need to listen to me. So I'm gonna keep telling you, I'm gonna keep sending you signals of LH and I'm gonna increase the level so that you try and ovulate this lady and try and release an egg. And that's why you have high levels of LH in the blood. And so that's what the hormones look like. And then another test that your doctor most likely will do is HbA1c, or they might also dip your urine to see if there's any glucose in your urine. And that's just a screening test for diabetes, because as I said, you may be at higher risk of diabetes. So that concludes um, this video. And we've covered a lot about what polycystic ovarian syndrome is, the symptoms you get, how we diagnose it, as well as the criteria. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts. If you have any specific questions, do let me know so that I can answer all your all your specific needs. But of course, um, if you um, have personal medical questions, please consult with your doctor because I can't give any personal advice. And um, feel free to watch our next video. Okay, until next time, take care. Bye.